Born on the 1st of September 1988, Quen Nguyen moved to the UK from Vietnam in 2010. She came to study business at the University of London. She was living with a son and a sister in Killingworth. She owned a nail salon in Birtley with a sister. Both of these locations are in Tyne and Ware in England, with about 15 miles between them. Kien was only small. She was less than five foot tall. And in addition to her work at the salon, she'd also been involved in renting properties in the area. It was through renting these properties that she came to know Stephen Unwin. He had a property maintenance business. And this is where this story goes from one level of craziness to another. But before we get into it, let's do the disclaimers. This is a true crime case. It involves real people. And then real people have real families. So if I want you to share it and comment, please do be sensitive while you do so. We all have secrets, right? At least we have little things that we'd rather people not know about us. Well, Stephen Unwin had quite a big secret. In 1991, it burnt out an HGV that he'd broken into. And then in 1995, four years later, he started five fires in the home of an elderly person. He'd been burgling their house, and that person was in the house at the time. But luckily for them, the neighbours saw the fire and rescued the elderly person. Then another three years on, it was Christmas Day 1998 that he broke into the house of 72-year-old retired pharmacist John Greenwell. It was in the early hours, so John was in bed when Stephen broke in gave him multiple blows to the head with a camera and then stabbed him in the chest. As a result, he got away with a TV and a video recorder. But Stephen weren't done with that. Before he left, he set three seats in the house on fire, one of which was at the side of John's bed. And that's where his body was laid. For that incident, Stephen Unwin did plead guilty to murder at Newcastle Crown Court on the 29th of October, 1999. As we know, the only applicable sentence for murder is a life sentence but he was released on parole on the 20th of December, 2012. He was released on licence. During those 13 years that he was inside HMP Swaleside, which is a Category B institution in Kent, he met another lovely chap called William John McFall. William was in prison because, similar to Stephen, he'd broke into an elderly person's house in the early hours. It was on the 5th of May, 1966, and the person was Martha Gilmore, 86 year old widow. As you may expect, she had mobility problems and whether she meant to or not, she did disturb William. As a result, he hit her in the face and then when she fell to the ground, he repeatedly struck her in the head with a hammer. He pled guilty to her murder on the 11th of April, 1997 at Belfast Crown Court, Ireland. And he was released on license on the 29th of October, 2010. I know it seems like there's been a lot of people mentioned here straight off and that can be quite daunting. So let's just take a second to recap. The coming incident happened in 2017. The people involved were 26 year old Quen, 40 year old Stephen who knew Quen through his property maintenance business and 51 year old William who knows Stephen from his time in prison. Stephen got released from prison two years after William and it didn't take him long to find out William on social media. He contacted him and he eventually offered William some work. It was in April 2017 that Quen and Stephen first met. He'd been asked to show around a rental property in Sunderland. And it was about this time, July, August 2017, that Stephen and William were looking into a new business. This one weren't quite as legit as property maintenance though. They were going around stealing big cannabis crops. I don't know if other people were involved in this, but they were trying to fully set up this criminal empire. They were trying to obtain guns and everything. They were super serious about this way of life, this business, if you like. And they weren't shy of people knowing either. There were videos on social media that showed William holding a gun and a chainsaw. There were other videos from around this time that showed them near cannabis plants and they were messaging each other about the prices, and that sort of stuff. In all, they weren't very well at hiding the digital tracks. There a message on the 14th of July in which Stephen messages someone and says, I need a nice piece. How much? Shortly after, not a replica. The other person says, don't need to be talking on here like. Stephen responds, okay, meet you later sometime. Three minutes later, he messaged someone else. Oi, oi, need a clean piece. You help? Found 200k crop. Boomstick with ammo. The man replies, no mate, sorry, not anymore. In early August, Stephen and William 
were sending each other lurid sexual content. It was just a few days after those messages, on the 14th of August, that Quen had been working at the nail salon and then she went to visit some properties. She'd arranged to meet Stephen at his home that evening because he'd invited around on the pretext of going to visit a property. Stephen's home is on St. Oswald Terrace, Houston at the spring. Again, it's still all in time and way. In the time before Quen arrived, William was at the house with Stephen, waiting for Quen's arrival. But they didn't have any intention of taking Quen anywhere. Just after 6pm, bearing in mind Stephen and William are in the same house together, William texts Stephen saying, we rip in the ch XXXX. Stephen immediately replied, telling him to remove daft shit like that from his phone. There was CCTV footage at the back of Stephen's property, and that caught Quen Nguyen arriving at Stephen's home at about half past seven that evening. She'd driven there in an Audi A4 car and parked it around the corner. Stephen let her in to his house through the back gate, but just before he did, he gestured to William to keep out of sight. When Quen arrived at Stephen's house at half past seven on the 14th of August 2017, that was the last time she'd be seen alive. Four hours later, she was carried out of Stephen's house, wrapped in a sheet over Stephen on Wynn's shoulder. The exact details of what happened inside the house over that four hour period is unknown, but it is certain that Quen suffered a terrifying ordeal. She was dragged through the house and attacked. They tortured her for her information, specifically financial information, like the pin for a bank account. She was injected with a syringe full of whiskey. Both men participated in abusing her. She was abused physically and sexually. Stephen raped her and he did ejaculate. He also used a lightsaber toy, placing it between her legs. A gun, which was owned by William, and I think it were an air pistol, that was also used on her. DNA from the gun shows it was used for both SA and to assault her with. Obviously, SA is assault, but I meant hit her with and SA. At some point, we affixated her by placing either a pillar or a plastic bag over her head. Having successfully extracted information from her, namely a bank pin, they took her bank cards. At around 20 to 10, Stephen left his house and drove to a local corp store. While there, he used Quinn's card to take £500 out of her account. While he was gone, William stayed with Quen at the property. Stephen returned and about half an hour later, William sent Stephen a text message asking him to come in the house from the garage, which he did a few seconds later. With Quen incapacitated, both the men tidied the house and cleaned up the house. It's now about half past 10. Quen is laying on the floor, incapacitated, slowly dying, her life's just ebbing away from her. Meanwhile, Stephen and William cooked and ate a curry, like they had no worries in the world. It was just a normal day, as if she weren't there dying on the floor. It was about 11 o'clock that Stephen went out, moved Quen's car closer to the house. Then he carried a petrol can from his van into the house. Nobody quite knows why he took a petrol can to the house, but he did. And then at 25 to midnight, Stephen's seen carrying Quen's body, covered in a dust sheet, out back, with William assisting him. Together, they put Quen in the back seat of her car and drove her to a track near some allotments, which is on Success Road, so it's about one mile away from Stephen's house. When they arrived at the allotments, they set the car on fire, with Quen still in the back seat, and then they left. It was about half an hour later that the fire brigade arrived. They put the fire out and found the deeply charred remains of Quen Nguyen on the back seat of a car. She'd been so badly burnt that she had to be identified by dental records. We'll get into it in more detail later, but forensic evidence suggests that Quen had taken at least one breath of smoke while in the car. She was still alive up until that moment. In the meantime, Stephen and William calmly walked back to Stephen's house. Less than five minutes later, they got into Stephen's car and drove to a shop two and a half miles away. During that car journey, William took a selfie of them both and sent it to his girlfriend. And looking at this picture, you wouldn't expect that they'd done anything wrong. They both look relaxed and William's even smiling. While at the shop, Stephen withdrew even more money from Quinn's bank account. They then went back to Stephen's house, tidied up and just went to bed. The next day, Stephen and Wynne and William John McFall carried on their day as if nothing had happened. CCTV caught them in various locations, visiting shops, they went to a pub and again, they looked relaxed and casual. But it was the use of Quinn's bank card 
that led the police straight to Stephen Unwin. He was initially just a suspect, but it wasn't long before he was arrested on the suspicion of murder. William was arrested shortly after. I actually read that he handed himself in, but I don't know. Either which way, they both denied murder. Instead, they decided to blame each other. And the two of them were straight to work at trying to wiggle out of it. Prison letters between them discussed the strength of the evidence. Thinking it was some sort of Ted Bundy, William stated that he'd been reading law books in the jail library and believed he'd found a legal loophole and that they needed to use their ace card or the CPS were going to crucify us. But that had the complete opposite effect because during their trial at Newcastle Crown Court, the prosecution actually used these letters as evidence against them and claimed that in the letters they were talking about blaming each other in an effort to get away with the murder. Going on to claim that the hostility between them during the court were just a front and in fact they were still friends. Stephen claimed that he'd actually developed a physical relationship with Gwen and he said that on the 14th of August he'd left her at home with William and when he got back from the shop she died. She was lifeless. He didn't know what had happened. He played the reformed character card too, saying that he'd turned his life around since leaving prison and he'd started a family, which might have worked if he didn't have tons of evidence against him going around stealing cannabis crops and trying to get guns. The pathologist told the court, in this case, the body had been subject to fire and large areas of the skin had been consumed by fire. They just weren't present and had been burnt. Most of the areas that remained were blackened by burning and covered in soot. That obscured any injuries I would normally be able to observe. Any bruises or grazing would have been completely obscured by the effects of a fire. Interpretation is difficult. There is some evidence to suggest that the deceased was alive during the progress of a fire and died as a result of the effects of a fire, but it did not establish it as a defining cause of death. I can't say for certain that she was alive when placed in the car, but given the results of a post-mortem, it is my opinion that it was most likely the cause of death and death was consistent with the effects of a fire. The alternative possibility was that she was asphyxiated before being placed in the car. I do not favour this scenario. Now I do want to say here that I know I previously said that she died in the car due to the fire and I'm obviously not a professional pathologist but in past documentaries I've watched and stuff like that there's been arguments from the defence that it is possible for smoke to get in the lungs after death and the pathologist here is saying that he can't say for certain that she breathed that smoke in so let's just bear in mind that although the pathologist thinks she might have died in the car is not 100 certain now before we get on to the verdict and the sentencing remember a few seconds ago when i mentioned the hostility between stephen and william well it seems they made a huge performance during the court at least william did it's reported that he just couldn't control himself and that he had a bee in his bonnet about the media from the outset. He continuously gave outbursts, head shakes and chuntering. He always tried to engage with the press. He was making binocular hands towards them. He was making a filming gesture. He was even waving. When he weren't getting the reaction he wanted, he then started making cutthroat gestures at the press. And that continued until eventually he was told to stop after a member of the court staff told the judge. But William's intent on winding people up didn't just stop at the press. During periods before the judge came into the courtroom, he would turn to the police that are in the public gallery and he'd just smirk at them. And perhaps his favourite person to wind up was Stephen's barrister. Now, they, they clashed a lot during this court case and I'm sure you don't want me to repeat everything that was said. It, it was basically very cocky, very arrogant. In his remarks, he was very much like a belligerent school child. You know, just thinking he's clever, thinking he's smart. When all you're doing is going, dude, just pack it in. So I'm not going to read it all out because it does go on for a while. So I've just picked a few to demonstrate what I mean about his attitude during court. There are a lot of remarks like, please don't underestimate me and think I'm some sort of idiot. Don't stand there time after time trying to make me look small and trying to make me look sexually depraved because that's one person I'm not. After that, the judge told him to pack it in and just answer the questions. So he responded, I've obviously watched too much television. I do apologise. See what I mean? It's that belligerent teenager. That, right, alright, stop messing and just get on with what you're doing. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? There's always a smart remark from him. During another spat with Stephen's barrister, he said, Your Honour, 
can I sit down? Because obviously there's a clash of personalities here. Then there was this whole performance where he asked if he could leave because he felt intimidated by Stephen's barrister. And even when Quinn's sister got ushered out of the court in tears because she was that upset from his evidence, William still couldn't resist. He shouted to Stephen, are you happy now? And during Stephen giving evidence, William interrupted again, shouting out, asking if he could be took to his cells because he was fed up listening to this nonsense. Now I'm pretty much gonna leave it there, but you get the point. It's just childish behavior that goes on and on. He'd pick out words, like at one point, somebody described a conversation as animated. And his response was to say something like, what, is it a cartoon? He's, he's just pathetic. Stephen, on the other hand, he would deem to have behaved quite amicably during court. And interestingly, unbeknown to the jury and out of their sight, the court had extra security, extra precautions in place to make sure they couldn't escape. Both Stephen and William were on trial for one count of murder and one count of rape. And after a five week trial at Newcastle Crown Court, the jury found them both guilty of murder, Stephen guilty of rape, and William not guilty of rape. In sentencing, we know the only sentence applicable for a murder charge is a life sentence. The aggravating factors were it was their second murder. It was premeditated, involved sexual, motivated, and sadistic conduct. It was murder conducted for gain. Quen was vulnerable due to his size and build. Quen's physical and mental suffering during the ordeal, and that the body was virtually destroyed during the fire. So for the murders, the starting minimum term for both Stephen Unwin and William McPhill's sentence was a whole life tariff. Now for anyone that doesn't know, a whole life tariff means there isn't a minimum term. A whole life tariff is life means life. You will never get out of prison. The parole board will not ever consider your release. The aggravating factors for Stephen's rape charge was he was on license at the time. There was ejaculation and he used a weapon to frighten and injure. The judge then said, Stephen Unwin, you are a calculating, manipulative and ruthless killer. William John McFall, you are an extremely violent man capable of monstrous behaviour. And being defiant to the very last moment, William McFall interrupted and shouted from a dock, that's your personal opinion. The judge then sentenced Stephen Unwin to life in prison without early release provisions, with an additional nine years for rape to run concurrently. William John McFall was then sentenced to life in prison without early release provisions. After court, David Hines of the National Victims Association said the parole board and the probation service should be held accountable for William and Stephen being free to kill. The parole board makes these decisions about who is and who is not fit to be freed from prison. And when it goes wrong, as it has so catastrophically in this case, they are never held accountable and that is wrong. It's another appalling example how the justice system is failing the people it is set up to protect. Four months after Stephen and William had been sentenced, an inquiry concluded. The coroner concluded that the known breaches of the license conditions to which two men were subject were not acted upon in sufficient, timely and coordinated manner, including a failure of information sharing, all of which were not causative but probably contributed to her death. There were five major examples of serious incidents. Of these, four were never reported to the probation service, despite a responsibility to share information, and one, though passed on to a meeting where senior probation staff were present, never reached Unwin's supervising officer. The last of the five incidents occurred on the 2nd of July, 2017, six weeks before Quen was killed. Evidence was heard that Unwin messaged a Facebook user, threatening to smash her jaw and take it in turns with another to rape her. The recipient raised a complaint with the Northumbria police, and told the police that they'd been in prison for murder. The police responded by ringing Unwin and giving him words of advice over the phone. However, nobody alerted the probation service who had a responsibility for the management of Unwin's life sentence. The coroner said the evidence exposed a system of protection of the public, which was at the time dysfunctional, contributed to by human factors. There is one more thing that I haven't said yet, and I don't know if it's true, but I've looked it up some more after writing everything else, and it is on six or seven different news websites. So there's a good chance that it is true, but again, there's no way of me confirming it. And these news articles report, there was also a secret element of Quen's life, renting properties for people without the correct immigration documents, some of which were used to cultivate cannabis. Now, obviously, regardless of whether that's true or not, it doesn't take away how serious, horrific, or tragic this is. It certainly doesn't, mean that she deserves 
for this to have happened to her. But I still had to report the information because you know I tried to be as unbiased as possible. And that's all I've got for you. I do have to apologise because after writing this, just as I was looking up the last thing about the uh, renting of houses, I found out that this had actually been done on a Channel 5 documentary. Um, obviously, I don't look for documentaries. I look whether it's been on YouTube or not. And if it had not I'd do it. And this had been on once, twice, but it only got like a few hundred views. Um, so I thought, yeah, it's good enough case. And then I found it's on a documentary. So if you've seen the documentary, I do apologise. And I'm glad I've covered it, because this really does prove what we say in the comments every single video I've done. I'm fairly sure in every video there is a comment talking about how lenient the sentences are, and life should mean life. And I agree. This case proves it. Now, it could be argued that if a probation service were doing the jobs, it might not have happened. But let's be fair here. If someone's capable of murder, you can't put it down to the probation service to make sure they don't do it again. In my opinion, that's the judge and the prison's job. I mean, both of them needlessly and intentionally killed their first victims. These victims were elderly people. Regardless whether they caught and robbing their house or not, they could have quite easily left and got away. But instead, they decided to murder the victims. And let's face it, unless the probation office goes round with someone on licence 24-7, they're not going to be able to stop a murder. A murder takes a few seconds. So you can't ever be 100% sure that they won't kill again. And it is really residing on me, and it does make me want to create a petition to try and change that. Because someone put it in the comments this week, and I replied saying, I agree. They said, what about mitigating factors? How can you have a mitigating factor to murder? Yeah, you've murdered someone, but hey, <laughs> well, you're having a tough time with it. No, 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 no. I understand if it's manslaughter, then there's going to be mitigating factors. Because that technically suggests, look, you didn't mean to kill him. Murder, in my head, says you meant to kill him. How can they therefore be mitigating factors? No, you've just took somebody's life. There's no yeah buts. You've just intentionally took somebody's life. And for somebody that's capable of that, there's, I mean, the, the idea of accidentally killing someone is scary as hell to me. So the, somebody that can just go out and kill someone and be quite happy with that, how the hell can we say that these people will ever be safe to not do it again? Well, there you go. Um... All my love to Quinn's family, uh, to her children. Some sources said she had two, but I'm fairly sure she's only got one. And it quite out down, amazingly, a child is named as well online, which I thought ridiculous. I don't know if I managed to get away with that. But they have, and it's because it's direct quotes from a sister, but either which way. Um, what an absolutely awful case. Much love to Quinn's family. Um, just terrific. You know what's coming next? All I'm saying is, I love you. Take care of yourself. Take care of those around you. And I'll see you next week. Bye.